Hey everybody, welcome back. Welcome to module two. In this module, we're gonna be talking about hardware and sensors. And uh, we've got a little bit of a, <laughs> it might be difficult to hear me if I'm not uh, oh actually plugged in. So once again, welcome to module two. Uh, if you joined us for module one, you know that we talked about background tasks and components. And now in module two, we're going to be discussing hardware and sensors. So this is actually, in my opinion, an extremely exciting topic because this is one of the differentiators of the platform where we're really kind of departing from the, the classic era of just, just a, a desktop PC that, that works just like a desktop PC and where we, we enter this new era where we're, we're actually acting a little bit mobile. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you can see what happens when your devices aren't working correctly. You don't even get audio and you can't even hear what he has to say. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we're going to even be able to look at how to handle things even when certain devices don't support certain features, yeah. too. Yeah, if I would have actually done a device check to see that my audio was, was supported, which we'll, we'll see how to do that in just he a second. He meant to do it. Yeah, That's it what was, he's trying to say. It's totally a demonstration, yeah. so thanks for going along with that. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about in this module. The first thing that we're going to do is may, probably hit the devices that are going to be really popular to use, and that is the camera and microphone. It's a media world, and we want to, uh, we want to on our device, check to see that we've got a, a webcam, um, and we want to use that as either a webcam that's capturing video or as a webcam that's capturing audio. And then we also want to, or that's capturing still pictures, sorry. Sure. And we also have a microphone on our device, and we want to capture some audio from that, probably at the same time that we're doing video, but also maybe we want to make an app for taking audio notes. And so we want to just capture the, the audio from the microphone and not do anything with the webcam. So that's what we're going to talk about first. And then we're going to look at a lot of the other sensors that are on the system. We've got a lot of them. The light sensor, we've got the accelerometer, the gyrometer, we've got the magnetometer. We want, might want to know our, our heading if we're working on a, a navigation app and we've got charts and we want to know which direction the boat is heading. Um, there's, there's a lot of different sensors that we're going to want to hook into. Now we're going to want to not only just communicate with those sensors, but we're also going to want to test the device as, probably as soon as our app starts up and say, what, what can this device do? What, what's what am I capable of? Because like right now, I'm running on a laptop in, in, in the room, and I don't have a device that has an accelerometer on it, so I can't determine what its, its orientation is. Uh, I have various ways of getting the location, so I probably will be able to get the, the geolocation, but I certainly don't have a GPS receiver in the device. So things like that, you know, we might want to know. So there's all this uh, uh, discovery of the device capability that we need to talk about. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is capturing from the camera and actually also capturing from the microphone. There are two ways to capture media on a device. The easy way and the powerful way seems to always be this way. Go the easy way. If that covers all your needs, then it's really nice and easy. But a lot of times you're like, you know, that, that easy case doesn't do exactly what I want it to do. So I, I want a little bit more power. I want to, to be able to access things at a lower level. I want to be able to look at the different devices and select a device or whatever. I need to, to have more power. So there's, there's that way. And so the easy way is using an API in the Windows namespace, in the WinRT namespace, that's called Camera Capture UI. And then the more powerful and, and feature-rich way of capturing media is by using Media Capture. That's another API that you have to do more configuration in that one, um, but you, then you have that power that, that I'm mentioning. You know, um, before you get to your demo, I was just going to mention that I think that this particular feature of all the ones you're going to go into is probably the one that when I go to events and I start to hear the different ideas that people have for their apps and, and especially the ones that are thinking outside the box and what they can really bring to the table that's going to bring a new value add to uh, the apps and so forth. This is so often mentioned, like if I could just capture this, whether it's for business use, personal use, there's so many advantages. You think about all the apps that have already come into uh, our world, uh, whether it's like an Instagram type of an app or, or if it's uh, uh, Facebook or, or anything at all that starts to bring in media more and more. 
why not let your app do the same? There's probably an opportunity for it. So this is one to really pay attention to. This could be a requirement imposed at some point that it must be available to do this or that. So. Uh, I think that this is a really critical thing and clearly many of the app ideas that I've heard so far, this is one of those number one questions. Well, how can I get that? How do I interact with that? Because we know the devices are starting to come with those cameras uh, now on both sides, you know, so how do we take advantage of that? Yeah, definitely. Good. Well, we're going to take a look at that. And as always, if you have any questions that, that we don't hit upon, please ask those in the chat room and we'll be glad to um, bring those up even in, in front of the whole crowd if it's beneficial. So uh, the camera and microphone demo is in Codeshow. So if you have a Codeshow app, you've got it. I'm going to browse over to Media Capture. Now, sometimes the name of it, if you're expecting to find something about video or cam or microphone or recording or something like that, you might not find that there. But in Code Show, we do have search. So I just tap the Windows Q shortcut. It's important to know those shortcuts. You can really save a lot of minutes, which add up to hours in your day. So Windows Q takes me to the search, and then I can type in something like capture, and it's going to find that. But I should also be able to type something like camera, and it's going to be able to find that specific demo. Okay, so keep in mind that that's one way to find the demos in Code Show. I happen to uh, use this a bit, so I know where, where things are. Let's jump into the media capture demo. And a lot of these demos, if you're unfamiliar with it so far, are laid out such that there are multiple sections in, in the demo, and you, you access them by swiping in between them just like this. Okay? So the first one that I want to show you is capturing a still image. And this is going to be using that first API. The API that I said was the easy way to do it. So this is the camera capture UI. Now, before we look at the demo itself, I want to jump you over to the code. So we're going to look at uh, the media capture demo. And I'm going to show you a great way to search in Visual Studio. If you hit Control semicolon, it filters your Solution Explorer, which is extremely handy. And I can look for media cap. That's the name of this demo. And then I actually get these search results. Now, inside of the calculator, CPP is not helpful. So I'll just collapse that. But inside of Code Show, inside of demos, you can see that I've got the media cap folder. And it's brought me all of the, the media cap app demos. So that's a, a nice way to get directly to all three components of a demo or a page that you're interested in. So here we have them opened up. And let's look first at the HTML, because in this case, the HTML really matters. Now remember, the HTML is the structure of your page, the CSS is the style and layout of your page, and the JavaScript is the logic of your page. Okay, So we're going to look here at the structure of this demo. Now, um, I guess it would probably be beneficial to show you just a little bit of an overview of some of the elements of this HTML page in the in the structure of this app. So in this app, I, I decided to actually enumerate all the demos to build that first page that you see in Code Show to build that list of demos. And in order to do that, I needed a little bit of meta information about each of the demos. So each of the demos you'll see have these four meta tags, the keywords, the description, who authored it, things like that. And uh, we enter that metadata there, and then we don't have to do it anywhere else. It just indexes that and uses that to build the start page. So that's you see that. Now, on a page, we still have references to the WinJS library, so those are there. And then we also have references to those other two components of our page. So the HTML needs to reference the CSS and the JavaScript in order to bring that functionality in there. And then when you look at the body of your HTML, hopefully you see something that's relatively terse. You want to see something that's not clouded with a lot of style information. It's not clouded with uh, a lot of spaghetti code that's just kind of written right into it. You want to see something that's relatively clean and represents the essence of that view so that you can look at it and say, oh, I can tell that there are three sections here, one about the still image, one about the video, and one about the audio. So that's why I have it structured this way. So let's just focus on the still image section for now. This is the first section in the demo. Now, in the still image section, I have its header, and I have a little bit of an explanation that you see show up in the UI. And I have a capture button, and then I have an HTML5, actually just HTML, image tag. And it's called captured image. Okay, that's that's really important. This one will, will show how how simple it is to, after you capture this image to go put it into an image tag. So um, 
uh, the next best thing is to flip over to the JavaScript file and see exactly what's going to happen um, behind the scenes. Now, if you're not familiar with Code Show already, you know that I use this Q method as kind of a, an abstraction of the query selector and query selector all methods. It's, a, it's an easy way to select whatever element or elements from the HTML page you're interested in. So if you're looking for the button that's inside of the element with a class of still, then you would do Q with a dot still space button, okay? And that's gonna bring that in for you. So trying to make this nice and short, because I do it about a million times uh, per demo. So I like to keep that nice and short. That's why I've written that Q method. Now, if you need to know more about that Q method or if, you know whatever, you can go look that up. It's actually in this project in the ocho.js library. That's a part of this project. Okay, so for that button, I want to modify its onClick attribute. There's multiple ways to hook up events, but you might know that onClick is, is the way to override whatever it is that is happening for that click event, or for that, for that button's click event, and I'm setting it to a new anonymous function, okay? And in this function is the code that's going to run when the user clicks the still image button to capture a still image. So when the user touches that button, the first thing I do is I instantiate my camera capture UI. Okay, so this is the easy way to do it, remember. Camera Capture UI is not just the functionality for, for uh, capturing a still image or capturing video. It's also the UI, which we'll see in just a second. It does all the UI for you. It gives you the ability to, I mean, shows you the preview, gives you the ability to touch the screen to take the picture, then it gives you a crop button afterwards and an OK button to accept it. All that's done for you. Really easy for the vast majority of the scenarios. And once again, if you need more, you drop down into media capture. Now, the camera capture UI has a, a method called capture file async. That means it's going to go ahead and do what it's made to do, capture an image. It's going to capture it to a file and it's going to capture it in an asynchronous fashion. So you'll notice this async suffix is on a lot of the methods that are inside of the WinRT library. That's because uh, anything that might take more than 50 milliseconds to run, Microsoft has decided to put that in an asynchronous function. So when you call that, it's going to come back to you pretty much immediately. It's not going to wait for the user to go uh, use that UI, click on OK, and finally return the, um, uh, the instruction pointer back to your UI thread. Instead, it's going to return to your UI thread right away, and it's going to let you go about your business, and then it's going to give you an opportunity to determine what runs whenever they're finished with that, um, that task. Now, you have an opportunity when you capture a file to tell it what mode you want to capture in. So the, the camera capture UI can be in photo mode, or it can be in video mode, or it can be in photo or video mode and let the user decide. In this case, I'm saying I'm capturing an image, so I'm going to put it in photo mode strictly. So they're not capable of using video mode here. Now, whenever the capture file async is done, it actually returns a promise, and promises we're going to talk about in a little while, but promises allow you to either use .then or .done on them, and that specifies a function, and that function is going to fire when the UI is done, when the user is done interacting with your camera capture UI. So this is the function that's going to fire afterwards. So the promise has kind of a, a payload. It has a certain amount of information that's returned with it. And when the promise is done and you use this done or then, you get an opportunity to capture that as a parameter. So I'm capturing the file that was returned to me um, when I did the camera capture UI's capture method. So this file may or may not exist. I mean, the, the user may have launched your UI and then said cancel, and clicked right out of it, and never even captured anything. So you need to check and make sure that that file actually exists. It's nice and, and, and uh, simple in JavaScript. You can just say if object, and then if that object is null or undefined, just it'll return false, and, and none of the rest of this will happen. So once again, we're, we're finding uh, an element on the page. This time we're finding the element with an ID of captured image. Let's jump back to that HTML so I can point out what that is. That's the image. It has an ID of captured image. Okay, And I'm going to look at its source attribute. You'll note that in the HTML, I actually haven't specified its source attribute. I left that blank. 
because I don't know that at design time. Rather, this is going to be populated at runtime when the user captures their own image. I'm going to set that source equal to the create object URL. This, this is going to make a, a blob string out of a file, pass in that file, and then it's going to set this actually equal to a string. You might not be familiar with this syntax. Normally, when you're dealing with images in HTML, you're setting their source equal to a file that you can browse to with an HTTP call, and that's where that image tag gets its file. It doesn't have to work that way, though. You can take a, a file, or you can capture one over HTTP, and you can create a local blob string out of that, just a binary string that the image tag is capable of using as its image source. And that's what we're setting our image source equal to, is that string right there. Okay? So that's the, we'll go to that level of detail on the camera capture UI this once, and you won't need to go to that detail in the next one, but let's see how that works. So here I am back in the UI. I have the opportunity to hit capture, and when I do, the UI launches. But a very important question comes up. This is the first time that I've run this app on this machine, and so it, asked, it has to ask me, can CodeShow, the app, use your webcam and your microphone? It's really important that the app asks that because those could be considered intrusive. I mean, I certainly don't want somebody who writes an app and installs it on my machine to sure. be able to use my webcam without me knowing. Yeah, in fact, imagine if this was not the case. Oh, uh, la, 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 la. The, it, it would be horrible <laughs> if apps could just overtake that without the knowledge of the user knowing. So I'm grateful that the Windows 8 operating system gives the user power and the developer needs to respect that that's going to be the case because they can elect to say, no, I don't want that to be the case. So we need to code accordingly as well. But I love the fact that we can build with confidence because now the community is going to know at large that, you know what, if they're going to download an app, they're in control, so they're more likely to feel comfortable downloading more apps because they feel more control. Right. Now, the question, I guess, is how does my grandma answer this question? The question of? The question of can oh. Coach <laughs> the can question Coach on the screen use your webcam yeah, yeah. and microphone? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, how does she Or how do that? I help her know how to answer this? How do you? <laughs> well, I, the way I would do it is I would say, what is the app that you just opened? Does it make sense that an app like camera ca you know, the, 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 the media capture demo in this app is going to need to use my webcam and microphone? Certainly it does. But if it doesn't make any sense, and if I trust the, the publisher and the sure. source of the app, it makes total sense. But if I don't trust it, then, then there's, a, there's, there's good reason to choose block there. There's no reason in the world for an app that does X to ask me for Y. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. Let's go ahead and, and hit allow there. And now it's going to launch the camera capture UI for me. Now, this uh, doesn't necessarily work here. It's going to have to have a webcam hooked up. And, but then it's going to show the UI of whatever the webcam sees. Actually, let me see if I can change the camera and get an image. There we go. Here is an image <laughs> <laughs> of the. We've, got, we've got a display. Yeah, there. We've got a display that's actually and looking we need at the, the fire ceiling. codes yeah. uh, in this building. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So here's the camera capture UI that's looking at, at this scene. At least you don't have to look at my ugly mug. Uh, and, and it gives me the ability to just tap on the screen and take a picture. So this nice, fluid, well-designed, well-tested, pretty much all done yeah. interface yeah. that I don't have to worry about in my app. And I've now taken a, a picture and I didn't have to do anything. So I also get for free this ability to crop. So let's really zoom in. This is going to the fire marshal right here. Let's zoom right in on the sprinkler. Now I can hit OK, and it's brought that image into my app and set it as the source for my image tag, That's my cool. IMG tag. Yeah, it is cool. It is cool. It's a good looking fire hydrant, too. <laughs> now I want to take you back to Visual Studio and show you why it asked me that question. Every app has a manifest that goes along with it. That manifest is at the root of the project, and it's called package.appx manifest. I'm going to open that manifest up, and I'm going to show you on the capabilities tab that this app has requested the use of microphone and webcam. Now, keep in mind, it's requesting the use of those. That doesn't automatically grant it. That basically just means this app is going to ask the user for access to the webcam and microphone. So that's the reason why it asked me that. If I didn't check those, it wouldn't ask, but I also wouldn't be able to access the camera. 
important to note. Okay, so this image has come in and landed as the source of this image file, but that was a still picture. Let's see what happens if we do this with video. So once again, we're gonna go look at the source. It's in the mediacap.js. And once again, you can see this by just hitting see the code right there. I won't do that now. Or if you have the source code, you can see it in Visual Studio. Now the, the video section is the second section right here. So once again, I'm using the ubiquitous Q method, which I, I think is just going to go, I think it's going to be viral. Everybody in the and, world's going to use if, the Q method at if some you don't, point. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I just want to uh, throw in there, it's been asked, even though I know you did talk about it at the beginning, what is this Q? What is this and, Q? And again, it's, it's a custom method that Jeremy wrote that is in the Code Show project in, I believe, Ocho.js file. Yep. So if you want to inspect it, but someone asked, you know, is it kind of like a jQuery? Yes, it is. It's kind of like that. But it's not based on that. It, it was just based on creating some really easy shortcuts for us to do within the app. Yep. Kind of like this, except I didn't want to use the dollar sign. That might sure. cause a little bit exactly. of confusion. That's right. Oops. OK, so the Q method, one thing that you should be aware of is that it does abstract both the query selector and query selector all methods. That means that nor you know how normally if you want to look for one element out of your HTML, you use query selector. And if you want to look for a list of elements, you use query selector all. The Q method actually looks at your query and determines whether it does a query selector all and determines whether it returns multiple uh, elements. And if it does, it returns them to you as an array. But if it doesn't, then it returns to you as the DOM object itself. So it makes it easy to just use one method all the time. OK, so once again, we're using Q. We're going to find the video button, and we're going to set the on click. The, uh, the difference here is that instead of just jumping right into the camera cap capture file async, whoops, keep hitting the wrong key there, the capture file async, we're going to set a video setting. So I'm going to create myself the camera capture UI. So I have that as a variable. And then I'm going to set the format of the video settings. And you can see here that I'm setting it to MP4. I'm, setting, I'm determining beforehand that I want them to capture an MP4 video from this. Then and only then, I call the capture file async. And I pass in that I want this to apply to video only. So this one should not be any photo whatsoever. Now, because I set the video settings on this dialog, that MP4 should apply. And when I call capture file async, that should be all wired up for me. But I want to do some stuff after the camera capture UI comes back to me. So I put that in the done. And here we are. I should now have a file that is a video. I need to test and make sure that it exists. Then I'll go find the captured video. Let's look at that. That's in the HTML file. The captured video, now this, instead of just being a generic HTML element, this is an HTML5 element. This was introduced with HTML5. The video tag makes our lives way easier. So captured video is the ID of that tag, and so I can Capture that and set its source, just like the image. And once again, I url.createObject URL. And in this case, uh, I, I add this little option, one time only true. You can look up the particulars on one time only. It's a, it's a performance thing because this is a video. But for the most part, this is just the same. I pass it the file. I'm creating an object URL out of it. I'm setting it as the video source. Let's go take a look at that one. Now you're going to get to see the fire hydrant in full motion. So there we go, fire hydrant. Actually, let's get a little bit of motion in there. Now it's not recording yet. If I tap, now it's actually recording. You can see the timer ticking down. I tap again to turn it off. It previews that for me. Let nice. me know if I like it. Very cool. It gives me an opportunity to trim if I'd like, or just hit OK. There's my video, fully playable inside the interface. OK. <coughs> so right now what uh, Jeremy has done is he's actually captured the video. I, he's using the uh, simple approach. And before he, uh, <laughs> he warned me in advance, he could have a coughing fit. So I'm, I'm stepping in for him. He says, if I end up dying, just, just uh, cut right on in. You OK, man? Okay, he gave me the thumbs up. He's going to live. 
I think what's really awesome about what he's just uh, demoed on the screen is how much power you get in that in those simple calls without even having to do hardly or very much code. Uh, so I, I mean, that's very good, Jeremy. I, uh, I don't know if you feel <laughs> if you want me to take over at some point, but uh, I, I'm happy to do so. I don't know what I feel either. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I got a scratchy throat. <clears throat> Must have been the early morning. Okay, we've got one more thing to show in here. Sure. And we'll see if my throat holds up for it, but if it doesn't... Can I actually, could I show that jack of tools? Yeah, absolutely. Jump in, that would so be a good So if you want to switch over to my screen, uh, what I want to show is with regard to uh, the various things that are capable, that your machine is capable of doing, I would highly recommend uh, downloading this free app. I wouldn't recommend it if it, if it costs something, but uh, this free app is Jack of Tools. One of the reasons why I would promote this uh, on this topic is that it truly can go into uh, all of the features that you have. You can see little X's on my screen right now because I don't have certain features on the device uh, right now. This is really kind of a nice way for a consumer to know, hey, what am I capable of doing? There, you know, believe it or not, there's some people out there that, that have their uh, device and they truly have asked the question, I don't know if my uh, particular device is capable of doing certain things. So Jack of Tools, which was written by a developer in Tucson, Arizona, uh, he was among some of the first uh, developers to show for uh, some of the uh, application uh, type uh, hackathons and events in the Arizona area anyway. Uh, he wrote this uh, application for the very purpose of testing out what your device is capable of. So there's not a sensor here, but I'm gonna check out what the location's gonna do. So I'm gonna click here, and sure enough, here it is again. Uh, the, the tool is asking the question, can it use your location? Now, of course, if I'm gonna download this tool to give me info about what's possible, I'm gonna say yes, so I will allow. So it is now uh, initializing, and it's gonna go in and it's gonna attempt to figure out what my location is, and wow, it does look like I'm in Redmond. So uh, there's no trickery, folks. I'm truly here. This isn't virtually from Arizona. Uh, I'm here in Redmond. So uh, then the next thing I could do is start to look at some of the other things. Uh, let's see what we have here, calibration. Well. I'm not gonna be able to do that. I wanna showcase what will happen if I don't have a feature. Uh, notice here, I love that the fact that he made sure that it was responsive. Hey, you know what, there was no accelerometer that was found. So this is an, a key thing. If you're going to investigate or implement any of the features that are going to be uh, discussed in this module, what are you going to do if those features don't exist? Because uh, let's face it, not all devices that are running Windows 8 actually have all the features that uh, you could take advantage of. Uh, a, another example here is there is no ambient light ses sensor found on this device. That can be important because you might want to trigger or, or attempt to do uh, particular features uh, on or off based on, of course, the things that you actually do have. Now, can Jack of Tools use webcam and microphone? Sure, I will allow that. <laughs> What this is going to do, it's going to show more sprinkler. Uh, <laughs> we are just really, really, we're good. We are good in this area. Uh, so it does uh, show that. Something else I'll just note that we'll probably see at a later time, or, or we're going to address this to some extent in a later time, is uh, check this out. On the side, you can see the app is taking advantage of an ad. Uh, so this is the monetization. Granted, uh, you know, he's not making his uh, money by charging somebody to uh, purchase the app. He's hoping that you're going to be looking at this for a long time <laughs> and that the app's just going to sit there on the side uh, and, ho and, and you know, that, that's the uh, opportunity statement for, for him anyway. So I just wanted to highlight, I was telling Jeremy earlier that I wanted to showcase this Jack of Tools app because it's also a promotion of the developer community that's getting involved early in the process. You know, Jack of Tools was in early, was actually showcased in the Windows Store as a, as a showcased app for a period of time in the tools section. And so uh, I wanted to give the kudos to the gentleman in Tucson who wrote that app. And also it could be a benefit to you 
as well in your development to find out, hey, what does my device have? Instead of you having to go write all that code to find out what your device has, you can just use this app and find out really quickly. Are you back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm back, uh, at least in a partial form. <laughs> no, you think I look bad. You should see my son. <laughs> oh, he was, no. He's one year old and he was up all night. <laughs> and that means that his parents were up most of the night as well. I think I can, I think I can probably do this, but if, if I just do this, <laughs> okay, that yeah. just means save uh, that me. That means save, okay. Okay, Woo. we've got one more <laughs> media capture demo to show here, and that is the audio, okay? So this is the one where it, it seems like a, a simple function, we're just gonna capture some audio, but it looks more complicated than the camera capture UI because I'm diving into this more powerful API, the media capture API, okay? So it's important to note that difference. So I'm gonna jump back over to the code We'll look once again at the HTML file first and notice that it looks much the same as the others. The audio section has a little explanation, it has a capture button, and it has an audio tag, the HTML5 audio tag. Notice that we're showing the controls on there. So then the JavaScript though is where all the magic happens. And in the JavaScript, check this out. There's some serious height. <laughs> Might be able to zoom out a little bit and show you what, uh, what this involves. It's just that. It's, it's actually not nearly as scary as it looks. But um, what this is doing is it's using this Media Capture API, which is expecting us to set up some settings. It's going to need to know a lot of information before we actually start capturing. In this case, it's looking at that button and figuring out if it's currently recording. And if, if it is, then it wants to act as a stop button. And if it's not, then it's going to act as a start recording button. So it's, it's a toggle button. So in this case, to set up the recording, what we do is we first um, look at the, the devices that are on the system. And we're going to talk about that in just a second, how to look at what devices are available on the system. So we can find all those devices, and then we can grab one of the devices the, um, that, that makes sense for us to use. In this case, it makes perfect sense to use a microphone in order to capture audio. In fact, I challenge you to use anything else. <laughs> so. The settings that we want to set up here are, we want to set the, um, the type of thing that we're going to be capturing. We're going to be capturing the streaming audio, and we're going to set it to real time, and then we're going to look at our device enumeration, and of the audio devices, and notice that we, when we captured our devices, we said I'm only interested in devices that are of the class audio capture device. So it's, it's found us all of the audio capture devices. This is going to vary based on who's running Code Show. If you have a, a microphone in your laptop and a microphone on a headset, then there are going to be two um, devices in that enumeration. But I just got it, got it hard coded in here, so I, I set it as a constant. So um, you can use device zero to be the first audio recording device on your, your PC. Okay, So you might need to set that to one if you want to use your headset. Better yet, make a modification to Code Show where it actually enumerates the audio devices, shows them in a drop down list, and gives the user the ability to choose them, right? And then go ahead and do a pull request, and then you'll be a contributor to Code Show. That would be much appreciated. <laughs> in this case, we're just capturing from the zero device, but we are instantiating a new media capture, giving it its profile, all of its settings, and then we're actually doing the record. So here's the start record to storage file async. Okay, Long file, but it needs to be, we're going to start recording to a storage file in an asynchronous fashion. And when that's done, and we say when that's done by using the dot then method, when that's done, the following function runs. Recording is set to true, so I know whether it's recording or not. And the, uh, the file name is captured, and then I'm going to go modify those buttons. So let's see how that works, even though you won't actually interact with the audio, because the, the device isn't um, supported here. I'm going to go ahead and capture. My button turns red, and, and uh, I start capturing. And then that becomes a stop button, so I can stop. And then I've got a little four seconds of audio captured. I'll be able to play that back and listen to it. Okay. So if you go into Code Show and you look at the media capture, you'll have examples for how to capture audio and video, and you'll have examples for how to do it the easy way and how to do it the relatively hard way. I mean, we call it the hard way. It's actually the powerful way. That's what I mean. OK? Cool. OK. Now we want to talk about sensors, like the jack of tools trade uh, app, like sure. jack, of, jack of tools 
trait. <laughs> Jack of tools out. <laughs> sensors. Sensors are the little hardware things that know something about your system, and there's a lot of them. They're they're pretty awesome. Um, you can imagine that uh, there could be all kinds of sensors. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Microsoft Research Project that was done not long ago, with uh, where they sent a Windows phone up in a balloon. No. And then had, had it parachute back down. Did not They notice. had an app that was written that, that was capturing data the whole time on all these various sensors and recording it, hmm. pushing it into the cloud. And just I guess just in case the phone didn't make it back down. Yeah. Anyway, As the phone was literally going in the cloud. Yeah, the phone was going through the clouds, <laughs> the data was going to the cloud, <laughs> and it went all the way up to, I don't remember what elevation, some extremely high altitude. I guess it probably wouldn't have been able to even talk to the cloud at that point. But anyway, these sensors can you know, give us some really exciting feedback that comes back from that, and, and that's what we want. We want a device that can really knows about where it's at and makes the user feel like they can use the device to bring them some rich information. Well, the hardware, the way this works, is pretty exciting. So what happens is we've got actual hardware that determines certain, um, it senses certain input, like an accelerometer that senses rotation about three, uh, the three axes, a gyrometer that, that, rep, that uh, detects rotation in, in another fashion, and then a magnetometer that actually determines the reference to uh, a magnetic field, hopefully the mag magnetic field of the, the Earth and not that magnet you've got in your pocket. Right. Because uh, that, that might throw things off. But these things are relatively difficult to talk to. So what Microsoft did is they, they, uh, they hired people with PhDs with, that, that, are, that I can only dream of, people with more degrees than Fahrenheit, to figure out how they can combine these hardware sensors into things that make sense for us app developers. And what makes sense to us, as opposed to a magnetometer with some relatively complex raw output, is a 3D compass. And the 3D compass is not just based on the magnetometer, it's actually based on the collaboration between the magnetometer and the gyrometer and the accelerometer, okay? But you don't have to do that math. All you have to do is access the compass, and whether your device is laying flat or at an angle, which you could imagine could in, in, increase the amount of math that needs to be done, uh, it's going to be able to tell you what your heading is. So pretty exciting. Anyway, that's the way the sensors work. Now what we want to talk about is how we access them. One of the sensors, actually one that you didn't see in that chart, is the light sensor. So as you mentioned, the ambient light, light sensor is on most small devices, most mobile devices, tablets, and so forth, and it determines the amount of ambient light around it. And this is important for a number of reasons. I, I think one reason you want to tell is you can tell that you can set your device to automatically adjust the brightness depending on its conditions. Uh, what are some, can you think of any other reasons? You know, I, I, I just think that the ability to, uh, I'm trying to imagine a scenarios where uh, someone would be in a particular, I can't think off the top. I mean, I'm trying to think of uh, something I remembered in the past that someone said that was a really good one at one of our little, you know, uh, hackathons and stuff. And I thought, you know, that is like the perfect reason. But of course, now that you asked that, and I <laughs> now know there's a live it. audience and, you know, it just went over my head. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a cool thing that you'd be able to take advantage of that. And and really, what's kind of cool is if you do have it, it, it it's so easy to <laughs> test when you know where the, you know, where <laughs> the, the little, little eyeball is. is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a lot of good reasons for this. I've seen alarm clocks clocks that are intelligent about knowing whether it's day or night and how to, how to display the LEDs. Um, you know that phones are able to determine if it's up against your head because it's, uh, the light sensor is covered when it's up against your head, but there's lots of reasons. I just want to show you how easy it is to get this data. All you do is you instantiate a new light sensor, super simple. It's in the windows.devices namespace, specifically in the sensors namespace, and the light sensor has a default, dot get default. Once you've instantiated that, it's really just a matter of of implementing the reading changed event by setting dot on reading changed equal to a function. In that function, you have access to the reading, the current reading, and you also, and then in that reading, you have access to the illuminance in lux. So this reading uh, represents what it is that it just determined, and every time it determines something new, it, this event fires, and um, you have access to how bright it currently is. So that's a super simple one. 
The compass is another really simple one, thanks to the, um, the fusion sensors. Uh, you instantiate a compass, just like the light sensor, and you get a default. And then um, in order to implement it, once again, you even implement the same function, reading changed, by setting on reading changed. And in that case, you have a reading, but it's going to give you the heading true north. Okay, So it's differentiating there that it's not showing you the magnetic north, it's actually adjusted, so it's going to give you the true north. Uh, I haven't thought about that before, that's pretty interesting. I, I believe in order to do that, it's actually going to have to um, calculate mm -hmm. the, the true north based on your geo. That's right. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, so that's accessing the compass. Very common um, uh, sensor to want to interact with. Have you seen any great apps that, that do something with the compass besides just show a compass? You know, uh, the only thing that I've seen in terms of an app that really was a good idea was the, it, using it in one of those kind of, uh, uh, hey, your group is going to go out and you're going to do like a scavenger hunt type of a thing, and uh, people uh, populated some coordinates and, and made kind of a game out of it. I, I thought that was a clever little use. Yeah, that is awesome. I saw one that was great that actually used the compass as well as some other, uh, the accelerometer, and instead of just uh, showing you the compass, it actually allowed you to lift your device and show the, let's say you're standing on top of a mountain peak, show the peaks around you, and because it's able to access Bing Maps, it's able to look and see what peaks those are and identify those and give you a bit of a hiker's augmented reality. That was a pretty cool, that is cool. implementation of compass. Okay, the accelerometer. The accelerometer is a really uh, powerful one that is that contributes to telling you exactly what movement the, the device is, is doing right now. So the user may be holding it upright and rotating the device back and forth like a steering wheel to race in a car game app. Um, they might have it flat and be tilting it. So this is really going to read the rotations about, or the accelerations rather, around all three axes. So you can de you can determine how you want to um, get that reading from the user. And it's as simple as the others, actually. You instantiate an accelerometer by getting the default, and then every time the reading changes, you have access to reading dot acceleration x, y, and z. Those are the axes, uh, the acceleration around the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. Now. The first thing that people want to do with an accelerometer is determine if the device is shaking, right? So there's actually just an event for that. You don't have to go into the, if it accelerates in the y direction this many times with this many g-forces, um, then, uh, then I'm going to determine that it's shaking. That's all done for you. You can just accelerometer.onshaken and then do something when the device shakes. So implementing uh, a shake event for your app is this many lines of code, just a couple lines of code. Very easy. It is. But let's look at a demo. Let's look at a demo of one of the sensors that probably people are going to use a lot, and that's the geolocation. Sure. This is another one of those ones that's abstracted in that the location is not just the GPS, but it's a conglomeration of multiple readings. It's going to look sure. at cell towers or, you know, whatever. And uh, you don't have to worry about it. You just ask for the location, and it gives you its, its best location. So uh, let's switch over to Code Show. And go back to the home, and there's a demo in here called Location, and I know my alphabet. Now, once again, important to note that the app is asking me, is it okay to use your location? You can imagine this might be a bit of a sensitive topic, right? <laughs> Especially if they're saying, what does Code Show have to do with where I'm at? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just got through telling you, you want to make sure that your That's app has something. just saying. Yeah. It could. It could. You might, you might want to be wary. In this case, just take my word for it. Allow. Well, at least they get to see the code and know what we're doing with yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, not, not all apps <laughs> allow you to see the code behind. Yeah. Now, watch the next time I go into this app, it's actually going to, it's not going to prompt me for that every time. Right. So what if I, what if I go, you know what, I accidentally clicked allow. I actually <laughs> don't want this app to see my location. How would I do that? I've done that with your app before. <laughs> <laughs> How would you do that? <laughs> okay, so if you go into the settings for any app, you're going to see that Actually, you're going to see some of those that you didn't have to do yourself. One of them is permissions. You don't have to do that one yourself. And once you put it in the store, you also get another one called rate and review. Mm -hmm. But permissions, you didn't have to make that setting, but it's given to you. And <clears throat> what you get in there is the ability to go in and select uh, this, this, these permissions for what the, the, what the app is allowed to do on your device for, cool. for you. You're and the saying user. you didn't have to write that permissions pane? That's right. That's awesome. Yeah, that was done for me. 
So I can turn off the location and you notice that my app has reacted and said, your location is currently turned off. Hmm. Right, that's the status of geolocation at this point, off. You can't look at the device's location. Wow. The developer impossible. did a good job responding to oh, it. Oh yeah, it's it's uh, it's bound. It's yeah, you know it's MVVM. Good. Like Got to follow the right patterns here. Okay, so and, and also <laughs> as a factor, the fact that I don't I don't have a geolocation available to me right now. Okay, so that is the uh, location demo, and you're welcome to play with that one. So you know. Of course, this is the time when you didn't ask me if I have an idea for this. Oh, do you have an I idea? I do. What is I it? I do on this one. So I think that what's uh, really good about this, in fact, I'm, I'm really stealing this. Uh, there was so many, you know, Arizona is so beautiful. Yeah, we, 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 you can be there year round for the, I mean, it gets a little warm at certain times. But now there's your, a your lot. Your tone suggests that you might be contrasting that with Seattle. Uh, no, 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 not at all. Just it's so nice there. Ah, I see. And what I what I have uh, found is that a lot of developers in the community, they're wanting this for field-based type work. They can see a, a business advantage to, let's say, uh, let's. Uh, I'll give you an example. I heard uh, a pool company, a, a pool cleaning company. See, in Arizona, we have pools in the backyards <laughs> because it's nice enough to do that all year round. So, so a pool cleaning services are very popular and. Uh, uh, these devices can actually be used so that people can be out there and they're they're doing their thing and and uh, you can actually keep track and see where they're at and what work they're doing and it keeps of course if you if you plot it correctly uh, where the field people are at and it kind of predict how long it's going to get take them to get to the next place so uh, that's just one little example you could see where that could really become beneficial as a business <laughs> app uh, in particular or e you know even if it were like some kind of a social app where you were trying to do something like you know some kind of a uh, here's my my route of the day or whatever the case is you know it's probably going to happen and if it hasn't already I just gave someone a really good app idea so, <laughs> route of the day there you go excellent okay so these are the sensors and this is the way that we read data from these sensors now as you saw with the jack of tools app um, you oftentimes want to give the user some feedback about what they're capable of right now if the, even if they've given the permission in the app to use their location it may not be physically possible and so in order to do that, you want to, ask, uh, the, you want to ask the device a few questions. And I've got a demo on Code Show called Devices. And I'm sorry, not Devices. That's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of Discovery. The Discovery demo allows you to, uh, and I've only got three of them in there right now, but more need to be added, um, allows you to ask these questions of the different devices. What is the current status of geolocation? Currently, it's disabled. That's the status of it. The accelerometer, this device does not have an accelerometer, so it's telling you right there. Removable storage. This isn't a, a device in the traditional sense. It's not, as in, it's not a sensor, but removable storage is something that we may want to interact with, and we want to ask that question right up front of, do we have have access to removable storage. And we're, our app may behave in completely different ways if we do versus if we don't. True. Yeah. So um, the discovery code, I'll give you a glimpse at that one. Do I want to save that? Nah. The discover code is quite simple. A lot of the sensors follow the same pattern. Some of them have a bit of a different nature. So for instance, with the geolocation, you have this, this concept of it, the geolocator's status. So for instance, you have um, the satellite acquisition that may have to happen. You have you know, cell tower information that may have to come. And so you may or may not have current, live, ready uh, location. And so this one gives you the status and the best thing to do is to hook into the on status changed and and give us some time and, and, and wait on when the see if the status change actually ends up reaching the ready state because it may be that when you're when you first access it it's acquiring satellites or it's you know getting ready or something but it, it's not ready quite yet okay so you can look at that status and in this case I'm using one of these uh, Ocho helper 
um, methods and I'm getting the value of an enum and I'm looking at the location status to see what its value is and then um, in this case I'm just printing that status on the screen. Okay, sure. So that's the best way to ask the geolocator what is, what is your capability and it'll tell you like you saw in the example it'll tell you if it's just flat disabled mm -hmm. by the user or if it's uh, ready or, or not ready. It's good to react um, dynamically and, and have everything update automatically so that the user feels like the interface is alive. Now the accelerometer is going to work just a little bit differently, not too much. Uh, I want to conditionally print the word does um, by testing, simply testing this get default accelerometer. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, in JavaScript, a conditional test will return true if something is an object, it will return false if it's null or undefined, and so it's really easy to just ask the sensor's namespace for the default accelerometer, and in this case, if it's null or undefined, then it's going to choose does not. It does not support acceler the accelerometer. And then removable storage. Let's look at the last example here, removable storage. So I'm going to look in this case in the device enumeration, I'm going to find all devices that are of type portable storage devices. Okay? Now, that's going to that's going to find things like thumb drives that I have in my USB slot, removable hard drives, whatever. And if it finds any, then in this in this function that I write, it's going to um, uh, it's going to be available and we're going to print the word is. Mm -hmm. Storage devices are available. If not, if an exception is thrown when I attempt to access that storage device, then instead of you know roll that exception along or you know have an exception at all, I'm going to simply eat that and um, instead print out on the screen that no, I didn't find any removable storage devices, so you don't have access mm -hmm. to that right now. Go ahead. I was going to say, so I think that's key because when you uh, were running the the Code Show app, it says. You know, the verbiage was something like, uh, this device is not capable of removable storage. Well, at this time, it's not because there's no removable storage actually plugged yeah, in. That would be a it's better way to work. It's <laughs> capable of actually, you know, having something plugged into it. But uh, I like the way that you just worded that, that, you know, should we have had some kind of removable storage actually connected, that would have changed the state. Yep, yep, definitely. That would be good wording for that. Okay, so I really hope that that helps to understand what your options are as far as hardware and sensors and, and what you can do with interacting with the device. You're definitely encouraged to interact with the device. That's one of the core benefits of writing to native Windows 8 as opposed to just writing a web app that shows up on Windows 8. You have access to all the devices. You have access to the entire Windows namespace. And as we'll see in a later session, you have access to all of the, for instance, all of the cryptography and encryption that's available in Windows. I mean, you have access to a lot of stuff. Yeah, and you know what? I've had a couple questions on the uh, in the on our online that I can maybe address that are related to this. Uh, one of those is going to be simply, "Hey, this is all cool stuff. Can this also happen in XAML and C Sharp?" And of course, the answer is yes. It, you can do this. Uh, this whole day is about the JavaScript, you know, the love of JavaScript, but all this can be done in C Sharp and XAML. And one specifically was, does C Sharp support sensors in it? Of course, it does, for sure. So uh, you, you could do that there as well. Uh, but alas, this is the HTML5 JavaScript, you know, CSS3 type of experience, the advanced experience. But yes, this works in both worlds. Well, and I have to highlight that there are these certain advantages that we still have to claim <laughs> being JavaScript people. And one of them that I'm thinking of is the query selection. There's not necessarily a way in XAML to ask for you know, all of the elements on the screen and, and do something with those. But with CSS selectors in JavaScript, mm -hmm. we're able to do this query selection and, and, uh, and find those. So. Yes, so that's our plug for the JavaScript HTML5 beauty. <laughs> it's a fun world. I've been having a blast uh, developing in, in JavaScript on Windows 8. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Uh, the, here's a question. Can I use Code Show with any Windows 8 operating system? So was there any reason why that you would have targeted it so it wouldn't have worked on one particular platform? or? It's a good question. Actually, let me go ahead and show you, because we're looking at the Code Show source. Let me show you um, where that actually happens. So if I look at the Code Show um, project, you can see that I'm, I'm, uh, I've got various options for you know, how I want to build this. But then when I 
when I export the project, and this is what happens when it's time to put it in the store, I do that by going to project, store, and then I create an app package. And I'm telling it, um, in this case I won't build a, a store version, but I'm, I'm able to tell it what uh, platforms is this going to be available on. And uh, this is surprising me because I thought that I had, uh, <laughs> you know what, it, this much have, must have switched whenever I added oh. the uh, some components. So look I'm going to need to look into that before I Show live. submit this to the store. Yeah. 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 There's the, the version that's in the store and that you're likely using is uh, targeting all the platforms. But I'm going to need to be really careful about this. As oftentimes you do, you want to try to support all users on all devices mm -hmm. anytime possible. Now, if you need to show something in your app, not show something, but if you need to do something that requires that it be compiled to a, uh, for instance, an x86 processor, mm -hmm. then you're going to need to split your package and That's you're going right. to need to have one version that targets the, the uh, um, the x86 yep. and another version that targets the arm. So, yeah, that, I just that's uh, that was discovered just now. Yeah. Hey, with regard to all the questions that are going on on live right now, I have to just say, I think it is awesome that we have the legendary Jeff Sanders back behind the scenes. I, I, I feel like the entire internet is written <laughs> by Jeff Sanders, all his uh, responses. Uh, you find so much of what he's already done in the community out there. So it, it, you know, give him a shout out. Uh, awesome to have him behind the scenes answering questions live for this Jumpstart. And thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it. Very much. So Anything else on the topic of hardware? No, I think that wraps it up. Okay. Well, that concludes this module. So uh, let's go ahead and take a break, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. If he survives the break. <laughs>